the first part I was thinking of, you know, Zach and I could just share and Darren um, and Caitlin, you were there too, right? At the, so we can share some takeaways, um, both the, the keepers, like things that we want to, you know, continue doing. Um, and then also obviously like what we learned from this in terms of what we want to do differently. Um, so I can start with that. And then when Zach comes, he can add his piece in. Um, but I think, you know, some of the good things that we want to continue that we learned from this was, um, I think I mentioned this at the working meeting that we had four panelists and it just seemed like the perfect number in terms of being able to have a real conversation. But I will also say, I don't think I mentioned this, that, you know, the people that we reached out to were people that we knew pretty well. Um, so I have a, a good relationship with Principal Morales at Bancroft. I know that I just knew that she'd be a really strong, she's a real straight shooter. She's, she's very honest. Um, I'm not saying other principals aren't honest, but she just has this like way um, that's very compelling. And um, that really came through. Um, and the same with uh, Maisha Real Sprigger from Ketchum. They're just really strong. <laughs> And then um, Zachary reached out to two parents who also or two family members. One was a grandparent. Um, and all of them just had, you know, different perspectives, but really strong and personal and willing to get in there, you know. So, so that worked out really well. And I, I would, you know, encourage us to try to consistently choose panelists who we at least have some insight into, you know, how they would be both in terms of the content and also how they present really strong speakers. Um, yeah, I think, sorry, Emily, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right on that. I mean, I think um, picking people who we know um, will be good panelists is definitely a plus. I think on the opposite side, if we do, you know, want to use this as a tool to expand our, our reach, we're going to have to go to folks that we're not as familiar with, but I think we can counter that by doing some of that prep work ahead of time and, and, you know, oh, yeah. and that type of thing. So thank I just you. Plus one yeah. on you on what you're saying. Yeah, no, and I agree. I was going to get to actually one thing, which is that I think one of the panelists actually mentioned this when we spoke with them beforehand. So there's two things. One is like, oh, I know what it was. So um, one idea that we had originally was to see if there were like parent principal pairs that would be good to talk about the same school right because that would be interesting kind of to have both perspectives on it or to have them talk as a team kind of like how did you do this as a parent how did you do this as a principal build strong parent school relationships and we we were talking with uh, Maisha Riddlesperger about that she was you know we we're asking her who she might choose you know, like were there parents that came to mind and she kind of spoke out loud about it. And she talked both about like, there are parents who are really outspoken and would be really compelling, you know, but then there are there parents that like she had to pull in, but would have a really important story to tell and maybe weren't, wouldn't be as clearly articulate, but would be important. And so that did make me to your point, John Paul, that's also an important thing to think about. And are there ways to also support and highlight the voices of people who may not be naturally good at speaking to, you know, an audience. So, so that's just something to keep in mind. But it also brings me to another thing I think we, that we would want to do again, because it worked really well, which is that we, we kind of had short interviews with each panelist beforehand. So we had about a half an hour on the phone with each of them. And just got there, you know, we asked the questions that we were going to ask, um, more or less. <laughs> and then we were able to get insight into how they would respond to that and then tweak the questions a little bit based on that to pull out sort of the best parts or the most, you know, we, we sent them some ideas of like what we thought was really pertinent and connected with what somebody else had said before the panel before the webinar so that then they would have that in their minds and of course they didn't like you know say those things verbatim but I think it just helped to create some continuity 
Um, and it really helps Zach and I to be able to ask good questions because that went off script because we knew like, oh, I remember you mentioned blah, blah, blah. So that really connected to what so-and-so just said. And we were able to create a little more like of a, you know, a connection between the, the panelists because we had spoken to them ahead of time. Um, obviously the language channel thing is awesome. I'm really excited about that, that we now have a Zoom um, account that allows us to have simultaneous translation and to record it. Thank you, Darren. That's awesome. Um, and thank you to Joss who translate, I mean, um, transcribed it in Spanish. So um, when we talk about next steps, we can talk about like how to build out the platform or we're going to be keeping all of these resources and then how to promote it. Um, but that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to as well. Um, Darren and Caitlin, did you want to speak to any of the other like positive takeaways related to like what we'd want to keep for the next time around? I'd like to add um, a lot of the positive of the attendees that did show up. I did receive a lot of positive feedback that I believe I shared out with the committee. If not, I can. I don't think Make sure so. to share that yeah, out. Like, that'd be great to see. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of positive um, feedback, a few follow-up questions on more about the schools, if they are charter or not. And um, so I can share that out. Um, and I think that a lot of lessons learned from this, I, I like I can envision just the pieces that can be put in place for the next webinar. But I, I just the conversations were were very good. And um, I learned a lot, especially around like grand families. Um, so I think it was just overall a very, very good webinar, a very insightful webinar. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there was a lot of content that takeaways, but I will leave that to you guys. You can watch the videos now. And that, Thank you, Darren, for and staff, if you also worked on that, for um, breaking it up into little sections. I think that's really helpful, actually, to be able to watch it in you know, these little chunks. Um, I just watched a couple of them, and it was, it was good. Um, so that's also something. I like the idea of kind of having you can watch the whole thing, or you can kind of watch these little three to five minute clips, you know, a section of it that feels cohesive. Um, and Zach will be joining us shortly. Sorry about that. So any questions or thoughts that come up before I go into what we learned that we want to do differently? Okay. Um, so I think the, the big takeaway in terms of what we need to improve is promotion. It was not very well attended. And I think I did mention this the other day that I think, you know, part of it was just timing. You know, there's just so much going on. It's amazing that we even <laughs> had anyone. Um, but I do think it's a topic that is very um, relevant to folks. So I was surprised that it was it was particularly poorly attended. Um, I think we, in the end, only had about 15 people who were not part of our crew. So that's too bad. <laughs> and we'd love to, to be able to pull in more folks. So I think part of that may have been a technical difficulty. We're not sure that, and that is easier to deal with. I think we'll, we'll have figured that out. I think the trickier part, and it's the part that you know, I would like help from the committee on is the promotion and how do we promote this beyond just our Twitter feeds and, you know, our social media platforms. Um, and one idea we had was, <clears throat> sorry, was putting it in the blog and kind of blasting it out, not both as part of the regular blog, but also maybe using our listserv or our list, um, of who we send information to or our blog to just to send out a blast for certain events, whether it's like, you know, could be social studies, 
could be a webinar, it could be whatever, the, you know, something when there are things like this that are events rather than working meetings or whatever, that maybe we could use our, you know, email list to blast these things out to. But if there are other ideas about promotion, um, I would love to hear that from, from you guys. I, I have a couple of thoughts on this. And let me say, I was one of the ones that um, I wasn't able to see it both because of scheduling and I was gonna come for a few minutes and I had a problem getting on, but um, this lives somewhere, right? I mean, it, somebody could go watch it today if they, I, well, I know I could write. So I think we should, you know, part of the promotional strategy is to just get people to watch this one, even though it's done. Yeah. And so to follow up on your point about email, I mean, we now have, I think we used it for the, to promote the um, teacher retention report. I mean, we now have an email list to every principal, I believe. Is that right? Malayo John Paul. Um, and there was an, and all the, the ANC, uh, the listservs, I guess, for the ANCs. What, what did we send the social studies out to ANCs or listservs? Both ANCs? I know we sent it to ANCs. Um, this one strikes me as maybe a little less relevant to the ANCs, but I'm just trying to think of the lists that we have and how to use them. I mean, it does seem to me promoting this to all the principals would be great. And I, one thing I would recommend is to create a list of, um, I mean, I think this would be a good one to create a list of LSAT members. Hmm. Yeah. No, because that's this is exact. And I think going through this pandemic, that's going to be a really useful list to be in touch with and to have them know we exist. So I would really recommend doing that. And, and for the most part, I don't know how it is elsewhere, but I think for the most part, those, the LSAT members and their emails are on the websites for each school, not necessarily every single person, but at least the, the chairs. Is that not right, Emily? No, not every, I mean, it really depends on the school. I think it's not, it's not like it's on the DCPS site, right? Is it? Right. No, no, you have to go to the school website. Yeah, so it really varies, I think, school to school. It very much varies from school to school, but that same, that on that same line, like we, we can call the schools and, and ask for a contact information. It's not that big of a deal. Um, I do want to, to, rather than going, you know, sort of step by step into who we might contact next time, um, Darren um, put together a task tracker and project manager that we think, I think if we look at that yeah. as, as part of this conversation about how to get word out, um, I, think, I think we'll be better off because I think part of the issue is the timing parts, like making sure that we get out information out earlier and not, you know, not thinking of things at the end. So it, uh, my, Darren just put the project tracker into the, tra into the chat. So if everyone can open that, I think if we have the conversation related to that, I think we may be better off. Yeah. Because we can add in, you know, the specifics about LSATs and, and ANCs and, and, you know, whoever, right? And I, you know, the other thing on ANCs is their email addresses don't change. So it's easier to get a hold of them because every, every ANC has the same email address. It doesn't change names. It just has the ANC level. So... Um, so that'll be helpful. Um, but I don't know if, if, um, Emily, if you've had a chance to look through all of this, um, project tracker yet, or, or if you want Darren to kind of run through it really quick, it's very much designed off the same project tracker that we use, uh, internally for every single meeting of the state board. So <laughs> every working session and every public meeting, we have a document like this that we go through and make sure that everything is checked off so that everything is done every time. Yeah, no, I, I've looked at it and it's good. And I think one of the things that strikes me is that we had, you know, a project tracker for the first one, but we didn't really know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So it, some of it applied and some of it didn't, whereas this yep. is real clear. It's like, yes, this is what we're going to do because we know this is exactly what we need to do. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And I think too, like having that once experience now now we know what may work, what doesn't, and we can still adjust as we go. So Zachary, just to bring you up to speed, um, we're talking about the, the project um, tracker that is in the chat. If it's not there for you, um, let us know so that we can um, repost it. 
The only thing I wanted to add is that I, I hope that we also keep in mind and don't, uh, don't forget that this particular webinar also came the week of early voting in the middle of the reopen. And so like, don't beat yourself up too much over the fact that you were competing with more things than one could ever have anticipated. <laughs> Oh, I know. No, it was wild. It was truly wild. And to be honest, I am kind of amazed that we were able to get principals to participate during that but, time. But that's why I just, I really think re, you know, really pushing to get this out. So, you know, now is really, really important, you know, along with why you should watch it because a yeah. lot of people didn't and it's very timely. I think that's right. I think um, that's a good segue to, to proposing um, the the date for the next one. Um, as you can see on here, it's kind of small, but it says six weeks out is when we agree on a topic. So six weeks out would be early December for us. Um, and I think what makes the most sense given holidays and everything else would maybe be um, December 9th, if we're keeping the Wednesday as our, you know, day that we do this. Um, so I'm proposing December 9th as our next webinar. And then um, I like Ruth's idea about, you know, having targeted lists. We did talk about that, Darren, Zach and I. I think that makes sense. And then obviously depending on the topic, we could target specific organizations and agencies that are, you know, relevant to that topic or would find that topic relevant. So, um, and obviously, Timing is very important. Yeah, John Paul. Can, can I ask potentially for us to try to do it on December 10th? Um, December 8th is a, is a social studies uh, committee meeting, uh, the advisory committee. And then on the 10th, we already have the social studies committee meeting and the research committee meeting. Um, so it, I the just ninth, uh, overload the staff in trying to promote all of these things at the same time, because I, I don't want to diffuse the efforts that we're doing. But I think so having it in sequence could be helpful because we can plug all of the things in all of the communications that were going out. Uh, that works for me. Yeah. That's fine. Wait, so I'm, I'm lost. So you, John Paul, you're saying you don't want it on the 9th? You want it on what day? The 10th. The so then we have three straight meetings on the 10th? No, he... No, he the, the social studies and the research are on the 9th. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, I got it. Sorry. That's fine. I'm and not. that's the last that's the last CISAC meeting. So we'll be we'll be out of the schedule of complications after December 8th. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So the 10th, but the you know, the important part of that is that it gives us time. It means we're on schedule, which is exciting. <laughs> so um, and I don't think there's any, what's nice about this is like, we haven't set a precedent that we're doing this every month. This could be a every other month situation, or we may decide in the new year that we have this down and we can do it every month. We can decide, but I think for now it makes sense to do it in December. And then, um, is there anything else about this? Um, I don't think so. So unless there's any other thoughts or questions about takeaways and timing, I would move on to proposed topics. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ruth, and then Darren. So let me just say, I still haven't been able to look at it. And so maybe this is just redundant if most people have looked at it. But if you were to you know, name like five substantive takeaways, like as a principal, as a teacher, as a parent, what I would have learned, what would you? The content, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So I think one of the big takeaways was that the, the both the principals and the families talked about how the schools already had built up strong um, family school relationships that trust had been built. And so when they had to pivot, that they were able to build on that. And I think a big takeaway for schools on that is just that this is, this should be a priority um, I think that's kind of obvious, but it was the way that they framed it was, was really important and clear. Like actually one of the principals who couldn't make it, but who we interviewed um, from West was talking about how before the pandemic, she, so just backing up for a sec, each of them 
we didn't plan this, but each of them had worked with an outside organization and each of them had worked with a different outside organization around family engagement. So West has worked with um, Teaching for Change and Teaching for Change does principal chats. And so um, Principal Jackson at West has been participating in those and it really focuses on dynamics in the school. Um, and so she talked about that, like the dynamics changing, you know, especially targeting families who would not usually approach the principal, actually proactively going out and going to their car and talking to them before they, you know, when they drop their kids off. So that when the pandemic hit, those would have been the families that would have been really hard to find, but they trusted her and knew her already. And so that, was, you know, that problem was sort of solved for her because of that. And then um, similarly, uh, Principal Riddlesprigger from Ketchum talked about how they worked with Flamboyant. And so they had done um, home visits, right? Because that's Flamboyant's thing. And once the pandemic hit, they couldn't do the home visits, but they set something up virtually that would simulate, it was like the opposite, they did school visits virtually. And so, but parents tuned in because they had that connection. They were like, oh yeah, this is what we would normally do. So we're gonna, you know, do this differently, but we're going to do this. Um, and Jessica Morales at Bancroft talked about how, that one was interesting because, you know, this is in Ward 1, there's a, <laughs> they, she talked more about like having to bridge the divide between wealthy and, you know, less wealthy families, the language. And um, and so she talked about how before the pandemic, they had already been helping families around housing and things that were not necessarily school related. And they had worked with Kindred. So theirs was very equity focused. Um, and, but again, like all of that continued during the pandemic um, where they're trying to bridge the gap between the Spanish speaking families and the uh, you know, non-Spanish speaking families and um, how that has played out, sort of how they've been able to build on those relationships that were started before the pandemic. Um, and there was a lot of talk about bridging the digital divide in multiple ways, you know, how that it needs to be better funded, that it needs, there needs to be more training for everyone teachers and principals and families and that there needs to be spaces for it. So mm -hmm. um, I remember Principal Riddlesberger talked about actually creating spaces outside of the school for students to be safe and to have um, support around tech, both in terms of having the devices, having um, access to strong internet um, and support around actually doing their work. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> no, that's but, good. I, that gives me a sense yeah. of it. Right, that's fine. Yeah, they were, um, I'm going to, I'm going to watch it. So you, okay. should watch it. you should watch it. Yeah, it was good. Something that, uh, st there were several points that stood out to me. I would say the principles were very transparent and very raw and direct in their statements. And I wasn't expecting that just given the political climate. Yeah. Um, and as I just was, it was really refreshing to hear them say the importance of communication and collaboration, both with parents, but also with DCPS. Something else that the principals pointed out was that um, in order for there to be strong family dynamics, they have to play these dual roles, at, which is often exhausting for them. So they have to be, they have to put on the face. Um, and and it was a, a comment that Principal Ruddersberger from Ketchum made like, we need our cup refilled as well. And that mm -hmm. sometimes is really hard for them to do the work. Uh, another point they stressed was meeting parents where they are. And so Emily talked about that, whether that was using different social media platforms, going out to the community uh, for Ketchum, uh, or whatever the case may be. And then as Emily also said, this idea of trust and how critical it is for parent engagement. Uh, and then last, I would, the fifth thing I would just throw out is uh, Principal Riddlesberger stressed the impact on learning. So she gave these examples of how some parents are really struggling with helping children do their homework and 
do their like, oh, I didn't learn math this way um, and how they're really leveraging their parent uh, relationships as well as communities to teach, educate, support parents uh, in order to better support their children. Yeah, and actually, th thank you for reminding me of that. I think that's important just in terms of the resources we'll be collecting. They shared really concrete resources. Like um, one of the things that I think at least three of the schools um, are doing, and, and I should mention the other two schools were Thompson and Inspired Teaching. The families were from those two schools. And um, at least three of them were doing like virtual classrooms for the parents or the families, which is a great idea, I think, you know, because, and that was at the beginning of the school year so that families could experience what it would be like to be in the virtual classroom to be able to then support their children. Um, but also there were some really concrete, um, like, good digital tools to use um, that they shared and how that was used and with whom. And so I think those are things that will be really helpful to share on the platform that we create. Um, okay. So moving on to topics. Um, one, I'm just gonna throw out some ideas, but I would love to hear more ideas and your thoughts on the ones that I am sharing and Zach. Um, and Darren, let me know if I've forgotten anything we talked about. But um, I think reopening is really on everybody's mind right now <laughs> and should be because we want it to roll out much more smoothly and smartly. I know that's not a word. Um, next time, if it does at all. So, you know, one thought is to have the topic be something about reopening with, and this is going to Jessica's way of framing it. I liked this the other day of keeping students at the center in the reopening um, and what that would look like. And I think that could include panelists who are talking about, you know, things that they are doing that they see really center student learning and student well being. So that could include, for instance, you know, again, I can't speak highly highly enough of what I saw at Bria. It was really amazing. And I could see that children and teachers were excited to be there and thriving. Like you could see it, you know? Um, and they are doing that with very little outside support. They didn't get a huge grant or anything. Um, so that would be interesting. I'm very curious to learn more about what's happening at Langley with, they have like a, a urban orchard they're working with Serenity Rain, who is one of our panelists at the last public meeting. Um, she's with Food Prints. I don't know how strong that is or where they are in the process, but that's just something we might want to explore. Um, and then looking at other, like there are um, schools that are doing um, small in-person hubs like Cardozo and Czech. Again, I don't know, like they're young, they're just starting up, but it would be interesting to sort of look at those, explore how they're going and see if, you know, those are the kinds of initiatives that we'd like to highlight so that, you know, other schools can learn from it and hopefully our system leaders could learn from it as well. So that's one idea is reopening with stu a student centered reopening, something like that. Um, something we had talked about before was focusing on SCL um, and there are definitely some school communities that focused on that before and are continuing to. So it'd be interesting to sort of look at that pivot. And that could include also looking at connected school partners and how that has shifted to accommodate this new reality. Um, on SEL, it would be also be a, a really good flow from our uh, November public meeting. Since we're gonna be talking about reopening an SEL there. Okay. Uh, so so that right, might I think we're talking be... mainly about special ed. Right. So, okay. I'm, yeah. Say more, John Paul. So, we're talking about special ed. Am I misunderstanding the, the acronym of SEL? Yeah, that, that's um, social emotional. Right. So, but there's also a, a pretty strong component, right, of the special education about 
um, being in schools and understanding what school communities can give to, to those types of students. And then what my thought was that the SEL piece of it can also then be applied through all of our students about whether or not they need to be in schools for that type of, of, of learning. But I think, I think SEL would be a really interesting topic, um, especially yeah. since by that point, we'll have almost you know two full quarters of, of education in this sort of potential virtual, um, virtual space. Yeah, I think special ed would deserve its own. Um, webinar and I you know I feel like every topic is really pressing so it's hard to know what to put first right like sped is pressing but I would argue that maybe since we are focusing on it at our November meeting that maybe it would be good to focus on something else at the webinar so that we can I don't know so thoughts those are my thoughts on it um so one thing I'd like to connect into it and I think this can go with the student-centered and maybe with this special ed, which I'm not sure I wouldn't repeat, or the SEL, whatever, is how schools figure this out at the school level. In other words, this idea that you, this can't be one size fits all. You have to have some connection between what do families at your school need? What can your school provide in terms of all kinds of resources? Sources, whether it's facilities or staff, and to some extent, what more do you need in order to provide that, which gets to the equity piece. Um, but to get people to talk about, like, and, and so these examples of schools that have done it, I think is great, and to also ask them how they came up with it, right? Who, where the, where did the conversation start? What were the needs of the, what did families say, or what did staff say, I mean, my guess is staff probably starts by saying, wow, you know, you know, these five kids are our most needy kids in terms of the being in person. So let's do this, this or that. But what, how did they do it? Yeah, no, that's a good point. How did they assess the needs first and then what did they do about it? Is that yeah, and, and respond differently because they're different schools. I mean, I think if we could develop that theme and, and start to get people to yeah. think that way while, while meeting sort of principles of consistency and equity and that would really help the conversation and yeah. I think that's definitely one of the things that the connected schools or community schools um, could be really helpful in talking about because um, I mean that is their their model right is to do a needs assessment and then provide the services for that and yeah, I think there's some idea. really great examples across the city um, the next meeting of the community schools advisory group that I chair is on November 18th. Um, and I can certainly talk with them then about, you know, some potentials about who might be um, a good panelist if, if we want to go in that type of route about what it what a community school means, how does it help and, and what are some examples here in the city that would be good. I mean, I can think of, you know, 15 off the top of my head that I think would be excellent. So yeah, great. Jessica, I saw you. Yeah. So I just wanted to insert because I got I got to go on one of the walkthroughs yesterday and I heard some things that I think are important. I hope to tweet this out, but I've been in meetings literally since 10 a.m. yesterday morning, except for when I was sleeping. So um, I walked through Maury and heard three things that I just think are interesting in this conversation, but also to our conversation around um, the reopening more generally. One is um, the building union rep who came on the walkthrough was delightful to talk with. And she noted two things. One, that the teachers are not excited about outdoor learning. Huh, that in general, that is something that the teachers have not been as receptive to. And that in particular, the teachers at Maury were not interested in. Wait, was Second, she saying in other schools too, though, that she had? Indeed. Okay. She said that in general, like the, the union's position was not that they wanted to push outdoor learning because no, it was something I, yeah, that, I've gotten that from the union that they're not. Yeah, that. that the teachers, the membership was not excited about it. So individual members might be interested, but that this wasn't a collective position they would take. Right. Um, second was that at Maury in particular, when they made offers for seats and because they have so few at-risk kids, they made offers to lots of students. Um, they, they had about half of the students they offered in-person seats accept them. 
but they weren't able to offer any pre-K in person because staffing, they had no staff who would volunteer to come back for pre-K. And so they had no ability to offer pre-K in-person seats, which is one of the greatest demands I'm understanding from parents is getting pre-K back in person. So that's just another thing to be thinking about in the school by school setup, that it's not just what the school thinks is best for their community, but also how are they managing this? And I will say the principal at Maury is wonderful and was very diplomatic and very careful to um, note how complex this is and not, um, you know, not overstep any, any statements that she made about this. But she did note that they couldn't offer pre-K seats because there was no staff to staff those classrooms. Um, and then the last thing was the situation around um, what they're even, what, what, uh, what other kind of customization would be available. Mm -hmm. Because they talked about things like um, doing mixed grade classrooms, but they're only allowed to do that one grade next to one another. So they could do pre-K and K or K and one, but they couldn't do a K to two mixed setup. And that's DCPS saying that. That's how it sounds. Uh -huh. So it might just be interesting. And I, I bring that up only because there is a school within DCPS, Capitol Hill Montessori at Logan, that already has mixed age classrooms that go beyond one grade next to each other. Right. Um, but it's a Montessori setup, right? So at any rate, those were just things that I thought might be informative here, but also ways to see if there are schools that are responding creatively to that or have figured out negotiable workarounds um, that might be of interest. Yeah, no, I think that actually dovetails well with what Ruth was saying and kind of what I had in mind, which is what is the reality, right? Like if you were this, obviously the, whatever reopening plan we're gonna come up with is going to have to take all of these incredible complications into account. And I think that was the big problem, one of them <laughs> with the last plan is that it was just too broad a stroke, right? We're just gonna do this. And I think the realities that you are bringing up, Jessica, are just probably three of a thousand, right? Or more. So I think it would be, very interesting to hear from actual school communities. I think the questions that Ruth asked would get at that partially, right? Like we could come up with more, but just like, are you know, how did you assess like what the needs are? And then what do you actually have? Like, what's your capacity? What are the complications and obstacles that you're facing to, you know, once you find out that it's mainly pre-K, we all knew that. <laughs> that you know and to be able to say and what we came up with was hey let's do a Montessori type you know that you sort yeah. of get people to sort of think about how can you and then accommodate you accommodate the needs and the realities right no I like it I think I think that all makes a lot of sense easier said than organizing but the, yeah the concept so one other thing I'll just note that was um it was tough to hear um and I ask, I, I know we're recording this, so I'll be careful in how I put it. Um, a member of the janitorial staff on the walkthrough mm. made comments after the walkthrough about how it was their feeling that people didn't trust them to keep a clean school and didn't trust them to keep up with the expectations. And their interpretation was this, the, the many questions asked by folks on the walkthrough around soap and cleanliness and sanitizing made this janitor feel pretty crappy. Uh, so just something to keep in mind that like, in addition to the complexities of the logistics, there's also the complexities of how people are perceiving questions asked as indictments uh, or criticisms of their, their role and attending to that. So if you all hear any more about that, like, and that really, it was, it was tough. It was tough to hear that person feel that way. That's interesting. Huh. Thank you. Can I just note one thing on that. That's interesting because the soap issue, I think is, you know, galvanized a lot of people, but um, where I'm familiar with it, it has nothing to do with the internal staff. It has to do with the uh, Actual lack of effectiveness and efficiency of getting supplies to the school. So that's interesting that there it was taken to be a personal uh, jab at the staff because that's never how I've heard it actually but which is not I mean it may be different in different places 
Who's Jake? I believe it will be a member of the public who is who's joining the meeting. Oh, hi. Hi, Jake. <laughs> Zach, did you put this note in the chat about this conversation? Or am I just seeing it late? Uh, it was two separate thoughts. One, I was just wondering if principals would feel safe to talk about uh, plans that may be in motion, especially as DCPS hasn't formally made an announcement. Um, and then I was echoing what Ruth was just saying that uh, I could see how someone in house would feel that way, but uh, more of the complaints I've heard from War 5 have been like repairs have not been completed or bathrooms are not up to speed, like running water type things. Okay. Um, to the point about principals feeling safe, like do we, like, yeah, I, my thought would be, are we thinking principals would just come out and discuss? Yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to square how they're going to discuss a plan that hasn't been formally announced to bring. Oh, I was thinking, so, I mean, one thing that came to mind when Jessica and Ruth were talking about, you know, how this could possibly be framed is that something that strikes me, for instance, about some of the schools we could invite, like Mann from Ward 3 and Check and Cardozo from my ward, as I mentioned. Um, I can't remember who else. Oh, Van Ness. I don't know if Van Ness participated in this, but they all, uh, the first three, participated in the invitation. Oh, Bancroft is another one. They do a Saturday Academy. So they all participated in um, DCPS's invitation to send in a plan for small in-person instruction of some kind, and it was tailored to their community. So in some cases, I know with Bancroft, they had a Saturday Academy before, and that was something they could imagine continuing and they saw the need for it. So that's what they did. At Man, they had teachers and I assume families who were interested in early childhood in-person outdoor learning. And so that's what they pursued. At Czech and Cardozo, um, they knew that they had students who really needed in-person um, support. So they set up student support centers inside the school. These are really different initiatives, but they were all part of DCPS's invitation to no, do I, that. I get yeah, that. So, so they Maybe would talk that. about that. Maybe. I mean, yeah, so I don't know. I guess I'm not understanding. What do you so think? When you say that, that looks like looking backward, this is the plan we had created. What I heard from, what I thought I heard from Ruth and Jessica, and I thought you, Emily, was like I like school leaders' ideas for what a potential reopening might look like in the future, how we might personalize that or incorporate some of these things. And so. No, I was thinking of it as sort of similar to how we thought about the last one, Zach, is who's already doing this? Who's yeah. already strong? And how did they do it? Like, how did they assess what the need was? Um, and then how did they make the plan? And, you know, to be honest, the reopening plan was going to disrupt every single one of those that I just mentioned. But now that it's been postponed, I don't know about man, but I know in my ward, those initiatives are going forward. Go ahead. So and to me, it's really connecting the past and the future. I mean, I think it's very useful to hear how, what and how these previous efforts were trying to do and why, what drove them and how they pulled it together. But using that as a way to kind of imagine how other schools could do the same. For example, and I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm right on this, so I don't want to go too far with it, but I think in man, it was partly about and I think this is what would differ from schools and it it's be, you can go from either end. I, I think it man part of it was that the pre K teacher Colin that the part of the issue was what would teachers come to school to do, how do we make this an environment where staff feel safe and therefore families feel safe. And I think it was out of that that came this idea of let's do this outdoor pre K program. 
So you can get at these issues from both directions. You can ask families, what do you most need and figure out how to solve it. You can also ask teachers who have their own sense of what they can do and what teachers need and they can propose it. And you, so it's sort of trying to show how that discussion can lead you to really good viable things. And where would the SEL piece fit in or especially? Oh, that was a separate thing. So I was suggesting one idea was focusing on reopening and what initiatives have been got it separate you know, yes and then i was suggesting or we could focus on sel i think we should at some point if not in december then maybe the next one and then john paul brought up the fact that yeah we're going to have this panel on sped that's always like a perennial you know fire <laughs> right like we should be attending to so I don't know. I think they're all kind of fires. I would argue, though, that we seem to be energized around this idea. <laughs> we have, you know, developed it a little bit already. And also reopening is immediate, like it really is right now. So I would I would propose that that's what we do in December. Um, but I think yeah. the only thing that gives me pause is I just I fear that it's going to be a lot of the same. Um, and same. I don't uh, like the discussion, like the web. So the first one, I think what was in part rich about it was we were hearing a positive spin on often negative topics, like how are parents and schools working together in a positive way? And we were gaining insights. I just fear talking about reopening with schools who've already done it based on plans that have already been submitted, given the ambiguity, we're gonna get a lot of the same. And I would actually lean more towards the uh, conversations around special education, because I think that is something equally top of mind, but we can genuinely gain some insights about what's working, what's not working, where can we tweak, et cetera. Uh, I'm willing to go with the majority, but I guess that's what's given me pause on the reopening conversation. John Paul, is this related directly? Because I just wanted to push Zach a little bit on, I, I guess I don't quite understand what you mean still about more of the same because it, it, I think what would be similar is that it's a positive spin because it's like these schools have this up and running and this is what's possible. It also, I think what's important about it is it's a message if system leaders <laughs> tune in or you know see it at some point or get a message from it is you did this they invited schools to do this this was the right move I think <laughs> or maybe not I mean maybe that's what we'll learn but it seems to me that that's sort of the message is like schools took this invitation and maybe this is the way expanding that invitation is maybe the way to go. So I don't see how it's similar really, except in that it is a positive spin on it, which is I think how we wanna keep the webinar in general. But I just, did you wanna explain more about your, and then John Paul, I'm sorry. Nope, John Paul, Ruth. <laughs> um, I just wanted to note um, that, that I think we have to be careful about planning too far ahead with other topics because we will be having new members join us in January. So that's that's all I wanted to mention. That's true. That's something to keep in mind. All right, thank you. Uh, Ruth? So I just wanna to try to make a bridge between Emily and Zach, um, which is that I think I like the idea of having these examples from the past. So I would push Zach on that, but I really don't want only examples from the past. It should also really look forward and talk to people who are in the process of what are they going to do, which I think gets to what Zach is more into. And I think we could frame it around very specific things. In other words, how have faculties, either in response to that first DCPS proposal or looking forward or from charters, right? How did they respond to the need of, of students in special education? Or how did they respond to the very special needs of the youngest kids, because those are two really specific groups. And I'm, you I'm need it. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go on. Sorry, I, I'm with that. I guess the breakdown for me is 
do we believe the decisions for bringing students back is going to be at the principal level or at central office? And so asking a principal, like, what's your plans for bringing students back? I just... Well, to me, the point is, if you don't do it at the principal level, we're going to have another failure. And that part of what we should be trying to do is demonstrate the value of that. That's sort of the way I'm thinking of it. I can totally agree that that's how it should be. I just think our system operates that the decision is going to come from on high. And again, asking a principal, what's your plans for reopening? I just, I'm not sure we're going to get a lot from that. That's all. Like very concrete information. It may be ideas. Uh, whereas I think other topics we can actually leave with some very critical concrete insights. So cynical. I mean, I don't know. I mean, but I think some of the insights, Zach, are these ways that you might do it. I mean, I guess I don't, I mean, I, I guess the other thing I would say, I, I guess I'd say th two things is insofar as we can present good ideas that push DCPS to think about this more in a school by school way with some greater discretion. Um, that's a plus. And if they're not moving in that direction and they're gonna mandate things, at least maybe we can leaven some of those mandates with these examples of how people have done things that met the needs. Jessica. Um, I have to hop to an 11 a.m. call. So I wanted to offer two parting thoughts. One, I see Zachary's note about highlighting charters that are doing this. And I, I do think that, that there's a lot of, there might be value in that, especially because there are a few charters that have been public about the plans they've done and how they've um, structured things more in the way we hope DCPS will, talking with their staff, getting data and information from their families. Friendship might be a good one. It's a large LEA, so it's got some comparability to DCPS and um, is expanding their in-person footprint at the same time DCPS had to pull back on theirs. But the second thing I was going to note is another option that's a slight divergence is this focus on how schools have been serving their special ed students. Because while obviously it's a district responsibility for compliance with IEPs, my hunch is that different schools have taken different tactics, even within DCPS. And then that DCPS and charters might have some interesting ways to highlight how they've been serving students with disabilities during the posture of mostly virtual learning. So that's my parting thought. I apologize. It's a faculty meeting at American. I gotta go. Bye. Thank you, Jessica. Bye. Um, okay. I think we can, does it make sense to just say that um, Zach, Darren and I will discuss these ideas further because I think we've collected. In other words, we've, Emily is going to talk me down. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You no. know, I would just say, and I think it would be true for others. I mean, I plan to be in touch with a lot of principals over the next couple of weeks and get a sense of what they're thinking about. So I'll pass on, you know. I also, I'll just say again the idea of keeping part of the frame of whatever we're doing as student-centered, you know, returning to school, keeping students at the center, I think is relevant just because I don't think the last plan entirely did, right? Like, and I won't say more about that right now, but I do think that it would be interesting to hear charters and DCPS leaders, teachers talk about how they're keeping students at the center and what that looks like. What if we also invited some a central office rep to talk about like a long, well that might complicate things even further, but uh, we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Any parting thoughts on this? I have one parting thought that is partly related to this, but more general. Just sort of thinking forward is almost. It, Almost all of, uh, well, let me say, a number of state board members now do newsletters. And I would expect that as new people come on, more are gonna do them. And it's becoming a pretty regular thing. And going back, John Paul, um, maybe a couple or three years ago, there was a, a fellow or an intern who drafted sort of pieces of newsletters that people could pop into their newsletters. And she left before it could become really a thing and established. And it's, you know, it's hard to establish these things. But 
I think it would be great, and I see Malaya on, hello Malaya, to try to figure out a way that the board could publish sort of in a newsletter format, a set of things on a defined date, you know, maybe like the first of the month or the 25th of the month, so that board members could easily pick them up and drop them into their newsletter on a schedule. I love that. To really, what? I love that. <laughs> I that would be really helpful. Because and and it could even draw. I mean, there could be a conversation among sort of staff and board members about it because to some extent, staff. I mean, I know I steal stuff from other people's newsletters and vice versa, and the the board could do that. You know, could sort of steal what other members had done, but also have stuff going forward, and it would just help everybody. And yeah, I think we're at a point where that would now be, you know, a majority of the board would really make be able to make use of that. So in the um, in the the project plan um, that already exists, um, so we would have the blurbs ready for communication and outreach six weeks out from every meeting. We're the, on it for the webinar. You mean? But yeah, yeah. For the webinars and for 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 the things that we're doing. Um, you know, we do have the um, the Google um, Sheets with with all the um, uh, the Google folder with the marketing materials and those types of things that can certainly be dropped in, um, and we can do um, you know little paragraphs or blurbs or whatever that for for newsletters um, for certain. I mean, and I know we tried something like this, Jean-Paul, but to sort of send that thing out, you know, that if there's a basket of stuff that's on a Google Drive somewhere to send that out to all the members on a, you know, well, I mean, once a week, every two weeks. So, yes, we can. Um, but I think it's also part of the responsibility then for board members to remember to check it if they're writing a newsletter to know that there's there's things available in there. So well, we can send it out, but, you know, sometimes. You know, I can't ever find anything on that. So, okay. Anyway, I'm just, it's, it's a matter of trying to get it done, you know, get it connected and figuring out how to make that work. That's really the point. And maybe, maybe it's not to send it out, but figuring out how to, how to take advantage of the new, what, how to take advantage of the, the newsletters that exist to make this happen. So that's all. Okay. Um, Okay, I think we're ready to wrap up because um, actually Zach, Darren and I have a meeting scheduled for Monday and we are going to talk through some of the things that we discussed today and try to settle on the topic and we will get back to the committee next week, um, hopefully by end of day Monday so that we can be on schedule for our December 10th webinar. And then we'll share any tasks. I, I think the main tasks for any committee members will really just be around promoting. So, um, because at this point, I think the webinar, we have most of the steps down and, and it's really staff that makes it happen. Thank you, staff. You can also uh, rotate facilitation. Um, I don't know no. if people will be, okay. It, <laughs> no, I'm just better. kidding. I'm just kidding. That's a good idea, Zach. But Emily and I kicked off the first one. Ruth, maybe you, Jessica, could participate in the second one. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> That's a great idea, Zach. <laughs> I mean, I I, I, if you guys do a good job, I don't know why, but you know. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a good thing to think about. And then also actually another task will be I, you know, Zach and I ended up being the ones who mainly, no, completely chose the, the panelists, but I do think that's something that you all should be doing as well, so. Yeah, and I think too, I mean, once we get uh, um, a couple of these under our belt and really know how to, to, to bring them forward, I mean, the lunchtime live series that we did was very helpful in, in being able to bring this project to fruition. And so I think once we're we're really getting a couple on here um, and have an idea of you know topics and you know we can start working um, you know in January with the new members on developing a list for the next you know six months or whatever and really develop how to how to come up with some topics that are um, adjustable and also whether or not state board members have to be the mediate the uh, moderator or not. You know, there's some topics that it might be best for us to host and then get out of the way. Um, That's my point too. 
something I didn't mention at the top when we were talking about takeaways, like the positive takeaways, one thing that I thought was really great, and it was intentional to some extent, but it really worked, was just, we, we reached out to a lot of folks in the preparation phase. So I talked with, you know, the head of what's it called, like the cornerstones, there's a new cornerstone initiative for families at DCPS. And I talked to her, Stanley, uh, what's her name? Taylor Stanley um, and somebody else at DCPS. Um, so they, you know, just making that connection, you know, was really important. I had never spoken with them before. And then she put me in touch with Justin Jones at Flamboyant and he was so helpful, like he was, he gave us a lot of great ideas. So that's now a really good connection, you know? Um, and then in promoting, we reached out to all the family uh, focused, <laughs> focused organizations. So I think this is an opportunity for the state board to really make a lot of positive connections. And it just made me think, John Paul, like the something like a lunchtime conversation is maybe even a lighter lift. And we could do intermediary conversations as well, you know, about special ed. We could do a special ed thing every other month or something. I don't know, like, I'm just throwing that out there that there are conversations that could be had because one of the hardest things, honestly, it reminded me of my wedding where the hardest part of the wedding was narrowing down the invitation list. <laughs> like, who do you not invite, right? And I think, you know, like narrowing down the panelist list was hard. And I think, you know, sometimes if you have folks, you know, would be great. Maybe we could just invite them to have a conversation, you know, and we do that as well, because I think the more we do this, the more connections we make that are important for the yeah, state. Like, almost like even a fireside chat. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I was talking this morning with some of the folks on the community schools advisory committee, because, you know, we're setting up our, our next meeting for that. And, um, we're talking about actually putting together a um, a spreadsheet type thing of the services that each school potentially offers, because what we found was that some schools didn't know that you know we might be able to provide dental services, and some people were already doing it right, like or some people didn't know didn't think about the idea of maybe providing immunizations at school itself, and like other schools are have already been doing this for years, and so those types of connections I think can be also super helpful. Yeah. Yep. My one last thing, contribution that I'm getting off is, to me, I've seen these webinars through WRE as a, both important for what they are substantively for WRE, but also as a possible model for things that could be done, as you're saying, on all kinds of things at different points for different people. Way back when, before I was even on the board, there was this idea of the round table, which I, like I say, it never existed in my time. I never saw it. And some of us have done things not as the board, but as individuals where we invite people to meetings on specific topics. But having some options, some model for how the board could run conversations like this, I think is great. And as this gets perfected, it becomes something we can draw on, so. Yeah. It is interesting. I think it's something that the um, pandemic has maybe made easier, which is yeah, doing things like this suddenly feel much more feasible. Yeah. You don't have to find the space or th you know, and so Agreed. maybe that will continue beyond the crisis, um, which is interesting. Anyway, okay. Um, Any closing thoughts, questions? We good? All right. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Bye.